what everyone gets wrong about the Winter War. Now we actually need to re-examine the effectiveness of the Red Army during the Winter War. For many of you, you will now shake your head and say, what are you up to? Well, I read a very interesting article and the author makes some very interesting points. So basically, we, for a long time, everyone, basically, so both the Soviets and the Germans and many historians, looked or overlooked certain aspects that were quite crucial. Now, for those who are not really aware of the Winter War, first an oversimplified version. So in winter 1939, the Soviets attacked. They have an abundance of, of men and material artillery and tanks far better than the Finnish. But they take heavy losses against very few Finnish units. And the, unit, the Finnish put up a strong fight. Units are, the Finnish are also recommended for their multi-tactics, which I did a video about. And they fight far larger Soviet units. Now then, on the big picture, the Soviets reinforce, they send more troops, and finally they focus on one point, and they break through finally, and the Winter War is concluded. So this is the very oversimplified version. Yet, what is very important, the Soviet army is humiliated, and they take very heavy losses. Now to put this in perspective, if we look at the average losses per day of the Winter War and compare it with the Battle of Stalingrad, for the Winter War it was about 5,000 per day, whereas for the Battle of Stalingrad it was 3.3,000. So during the Winter War their losses were higher. And since the world looked on, so basically for some there's, there's this important picture of you see the frozen corpses of the Red Army soldiers lying in the snow and burned out tanks and everything. These are the pictures that went for the press back then and if you look at Finland, so and so everyone basically take notes and they say, okay, the Red Army is too weak. The purchase made them inefficient. Many other problems, communism and what the arguments were. And even the Red Army high command assessment was, they saw it as a failure. Ultimately it won, but they saw their performance as a failure. Yet there's one crucial aspect missing here. Now there were deserters. There were units and formations in disarray. There was bad leadership, there was bad morale, heavy losses, bad preparations, for instance, lacking sheaths for units or lacking the proper food, and underestimation of the Finns. But the big important point is the Red Army, although suffering under tremendous losses, duress and everything, did not break. They did not break as an institution. And generally, there was no mass surrender. So, we need to take a look at what actually worked. Now, the number of prisoners of war was actually rather low. Another important point was that the civilian and military discipline held. This was to a certain degree through strong propaganda. So, basically, they could convince a large part of the population and also their soldiers that it was actually the fault of the Finns that the war broke out. And another in in aspect was that there was court martial. So, for instance, regimental commanders were executed if there was uh, issues with discipline and other points. But generally, unit cohesion held for the most part. There were no mass surrenders. And although sometimes Soviet units were cut off and encircled, the Finns had actually problems clearing out. Why? Because the Soviets often fought this to the bitter end. They stubbornly defended when they were encircled. This wouldn't be the case if the unit cohesion and the other aspects were not given. So there was no collapse and actually all the points out by every measure, a collapse would have been expected of the Red Army. There was bad preparation, there was lackluster leadership and they took heavy losses, but it didn't collapse. Now effective, the combat effectiveness itself was limited. But the Red Army showed it could take tremendous losses, bad leadership and everything, but still could push forward. And this is a point of effectiveness that nearly everyone overlooked. Because basically, to a certain degree, it's always the, the Red Army in the Winter War was mostly a laughing stock. Of course, there's also very much sympathies for the, for the Finns, because they fought very violently and they were clearly 
completely outnumbered, had not enough material and everything else. But at the same time, we, I think too many basically just followed the trail. Okay, we disregarded the Red Army. So the Red Army as an institution held together and functioned. And this is in contrast to the First World War, where this was not the case, where it collapsed. And there's this famous quote about Hitler just saying, okay, we just need to kick in the door and everything will collapse. And if one had looked at the Winter War properly, it was clearly the case this was not going to be that way likely. Because even during an attack, the Red Army didn't collapse and they continued to attack further. So when defending, usually units are, or usually armies are way more valiant or stronger than they are on the attack. And this also makes clear again that it's very important to take a proper perspective and a proper context. Because if you just look at the tactical effectiveness of the Red Army on the Winter War, you say, well, they are not particularly combat effective. But if you look at the whole institution and the issue that they could continue to fight, even under tremendous losses and all the other aspects, then you actually realize, okay, the Red Army at certain elements or at certain levels was very effective actually, because to do this, and this is sometimes because we get lost in the details and, and then we just repeat the narrative, the old narrative we had, oh yeah, this and this and this. And I think this is a, very similar to my video on the, on the most underrated German Panzer, which I think is the Panzer one. If you just look at the details, it's, it's a rather weak tank undergunned, underarmored, everything is mediocre, bad reviews from the Germans, from the Soviets, everyone else. But if you look at the bigger picture on the creation of the Panzer divisions, which were crucial for the German successes, you actually realize it doesn't work without the Panzer I. And here you have this with the Winter War. If you look at the performance of the Red Army as a whole in the Winter War, that it held out, then you look at Barbarossa and Case Blue, then actually, oh, it makes more sense now because they stubbornly held, even if they were encircled, they continued pushing forward. And this was also the case during Barbarossa, continuous counter-offensives and everything else. So the Red Army was very well suited for a battle of attrition, not only due to the numbers, but also how the units held together and kept on fighting. Now, some people often argue, why write new books about history or military history? Because there are so many books already out there. And this is probably one of the best examples because it, the narrative was continued all over and actually it makes a lot of sense if you look at the situation. So sometimes a reassessment is necessary from more of an outside perspective or to look at it, another detail or another point to get a better understanding of the whole picture. So I hope you learned something new. Thank you for watching. And big thank you here to all my supporters on Patreon, subscribe, and PayPal. Thank you for watching and see you next time.